project email list that you can email us comments, information, questions at as well. Uh, for people that can't attend meetings, let them know to go that or to call the phone. And we have the project website set up already. <laughs> On the project website, one of the tools that we have is an interactive map. And we're going to have a how-to uh, list of directions on how to use that map. For those of you that visit the website, you can click on it and zero in on your property or where you know issues are, plot a point, let us know that address, what the issue is at that location, and then how we can get a hold of you if we have more comments. In addition to all the, or more questions for you, in addition to all the information that's been collected, we're collecting more. And we're incorporating your comments and your input into this planning process because we know there's so many things out there that either you have questions about or you have comments that you just want to get that information out to all the avenues that are out there. But like Dave said, everything that you've already provided input on at this point, we're wrapping that into this plan. We're just covering all the bases. Oh, that's right. One other thing to mention is that it is all public. So just be aware of that, that when it is there, people can look at those comments and know kind of what issues are in their, their area um, and that that will be able to be reviewed by anybody who visits the website. And, and if you do want to put, you can't, you can't upload pictures or anything there. If you do want to provide supplemental data like that, go to the email and zero through those marbles. If it's a bit large files, if you email us and say, hey, I've got a bunch of stuff I want to send to you, we can work out of that TV site on something like that. So, like, like Andre said, if you put your contact info up there, it's on the internet for anybody to read or do. So, keep that in mind. So folks, I want to go back to some of the issues you highlighted at the beginning and see if we covered them. And then also get more questions from you about what we just presented. Um, so the location of McConnell Ponds, that's being addressed in the Lions PDGs, is that correct? Jim Marie? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, the drawings and the data that's being incorporated, Dave spoke about that, that we do have some very accurate data and some data that is a little bit inaccurate. We're identifying what that is so we can make some good I'll decisions off of that. you have that out to other agencies in the county because apparently some of them are not even close to what you're looking at right here and showing us. Yeah, uh, they, they do have it. They just, it just became available very recently. So, um, but, but it is out there. So transportation, but yeah, not too accurate. At least in rate. Yeah, from what you saw at the perfect, it sounds like they didn't have that, that data set at the time, and um, we know people work there, we'll, we'll work with them to make sure that they have that information. Can I pick it up a little bit? Mm -hmm. So it's been nine months, and yes, we've been patient, but. Yep. Running out. Yeah. Running out. Completely understandable. Dave, how are the drainages and uh, going to be handled in the master plan? How are they being looked at? Um, so. Yeah, I think I think Rick Gulch is in the in the lines in the in the reach port. Um, so you want to come to this table after? Sure. And see who, who had their comment. And then we can talk more about it in detail. Um, so flood mitigation is something that we'll be looking at closer within each of the reaches, seeing what happened and how to address those things. We'll be coming back to you at those community specific meetings to talk more about some of the flood mitigation strategies and and options that are out there. Uh, Dave, would you like to address the floodway, floodplain, just one more time about yeah, that? Yeah, it's great. They didn't mention that. But that's a long process. I've, you know, that whole 20 years of working on in water resources, uh, the majority of that, I have had some dealings with FEMA. I've been a major contractor at FEMA for 40 years as a company. Uh, I know the process really well. And um, between, you know, going out there and, and supplementing that LIDAR data to get the, the actual channel work that's been done since then, um, to come to a conclusion on what the hydrology numbers are, what those discharges are for the 100 year event, to um, updating, model, doing new models, hydraulic models for that, and then mapping it, and then going through the FEMA due process, which is very rigorous as well. Um, you know, you're talking three to five years to start the day. So David, could you explain quickly, in a very layperson's terms, what's the difference between a floodplain and a floodway? Oh, and for sure. what is the significance of the two? 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, flood plane is you take your, your hydraulic model, um, and you're going to have uh, water surface elevations. Well, let's see, here's your screen. You cut cross sections. That's going to look something like that. And then you have a computer model that starts at a point and you start calculating back up, up the stream to get water surface elevations of, at each of these. And then you're going to plot that on contour information to come up with your flood plane. Okay? And that's just where that elevation hits the ground. So if this is what you're your elevation is at this cross section. Here's 1001. I should have made this six instead of one. Sorry, six here. Um, if this is the water surface elevation, and then this point here is going to match that point there, and this one here is going to match that one there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what a floodway is, it's a regulatory tool to manage development. And what you do in the computer model is you say, okay, theoretically, I could fill in from this side and this side. I could, I could just fill that in with dirt, building, whatever you want. I can encroach on that floodplain this much and only cause a one foot rise in water surface elevation. And then this point and this point starts getting plotted along here and you have your floodway. Dave, that top graphic, you're looking at it from the top down. Yeah, you're looking, this oh, is plan view. That's you're aerial. Looking, that's aerial, yeah. Sorry, this is cross section. Okay. Um, then what are the implications, that's the floodway, what are the implications, uh, regulatory implications in the floodway is that if you're in the floodway and um, communities can choose to administer a floodway or not. Um, we, we do have sometimes we put studies on where the, they, they don't want a floodway um, and there, there are regulations associated with that too but say a community decides yes we want to we want to regulate our our floodplain in this way and have a floodway, then they're held by their NFI, National Flood Insurance Program regulations that they can't do anything inside that floodway construction-wise um, that causes any increase in the 100-year water surface elevation. So um, now there's sometimes where you have to do something inside the floodway. You could never replace a bridge if you didn't do that. So there are ways, there's just more red tape to do. That's where you get to do a conditional letter of map revision through FEMA, um, so, but it's basically, if you, if you do go down that route and you have to do a project that does affect the floodway, does cause an increase, as long as you prove that you're not affecting any insurable structures, so you're not, somebody's house is already in the floodplain, you're not making it worse on them, um, that you looked at alternatives that wouldn't cause rise in the, in the 100 year water surface elevation, and, um, okay. yeah. <laughs> There's three of them. The other one's not so as important. So it's more a regulatory kind of thing. You can choose to, it's not a, this is where the water went during the flood. No, okay. no, and everybody, you know, everybody always thinks that. They're like, this is just the worst part of the flood. It's, uh, you know, by, by definition, it's usually the channel and the highest, mm -hmm. highest point of conveyance of where the water came through, because you're just kind of, reserving that corridor for that flood to happen without causing wreaking as much havoc. Absolutely, that, that, that sedimentation and, and, it's, and that, it also has areas that are probably three, five feet lower. Um, the, the stability of the streams all throughout the watershed are in disarray at this point. Um, either sedimentation was scoured out because of debris dam block, blockages that let go and scoured it down to bedrock up in the canyon and that all went somewhere and anytime it hits constriction or any kind of slowdown that sediment starts falling out and piling up. That's part of what that geomorph uh, geomorphology analysis will be to look at. What was, and, and that's the best thing about having that pre-flood LIDAR, is we know exactly what that stream was like before the flood. Oh, yeah. We can look at that, we're gonna do profiles and say, wow, this thing just totally flattened out upstream of that road up to this point. What are we gonna do about that? What can we do about that? And looking at solutions that, that, that are gonna be long-term try to help it get back to equilibrium as soon as possible. Are flood elevations going to change? Depends. 
depends on depends on what the solution is in that area. Um, you know, that's something we're going to look at. If it's if it's one of those areas that that piled up a bunch of sediment, obviously that hundred year floodplain and water surface elevation is bigger and higher than it was before. All things being the same, right? So when we look at that, maybe in, maybe in one stretch of stream, that's fine. It can it can stay like that. And it has room to move and come and find its own equilibrium. But if that's through an area where there's there's homes and people living, we're going to have to come up with other solutions um, because it's just not going to be acceptable to leave them in harm's way, right? So it's going to be that balancing act. Some cases it's going to be, hey, let's leave it be. It's status quo on some of those. In some areas you're just going to let nature take its course. But whenever you get into the interface between the urban, you know, developed areas and nature, we're not going to have those options, right? Tonight, Dave Hartbridge is going to be addressing the master plan. Uh, we will evaluate bridges once we once we come up with what 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 the information we have for hydrology and hydraulics. We'll be evaluating the size of bridges, whether they're they're adequately sized, um, and, and then making recommendations if a bridge needs to be upsized, and then that cost goes that becomes a project of upsizing that bridge. Um, whichever one it happens to be. And the restoration of riverbanks? Um, that, that goes right back to that, that discussion we were just having on the geomorphology and deciding what, what the ideal stream alignment is um, for long-term sustainability. Then the other thing that we mentioned during the presentation is that time frame for projects. Uh, the master plan will be wrapped up here by the end of September. The different um, jurisdictions, local governments, will be adopting that master plan, and that is just up to the funding that becomes available and being able to pursue that funding for a project to get implemented from being identified in the master plan. If, as long as we talk about water flow, uh, what can be done in the master plan about controlling water flows? Okay. Uh, regional detention is going to be something you look at. Uh, you know, there's there's a few things you can do with a flood. You can either deal with that slug of water whenever it eventually comes and plan to be more resilient against it or you can also look at reducing what that what those peak discharges are going to be and one way to do that is with what we call regional detention or retention and so that's usually you know we call them a detention or retention pond detention means it fills up and then releases at a certain rate retention means it fills up and it just holds it back just stays there so if you did put a dam at the mouth of the mouth of the choke of the canyon and you know you could store so many acre feet of water and then release it at a at a certain rate you could better predict and, and reduce your flood risk so it's something that's taken into account but then part of what we take into account is what's the local permitting requirements um, you know you, you got to get a 404 permit if you're going to do something in the waterway um, who owns that land you know is, is the mine going to sell it to you to for, for that for the area you need to make that reservoir um, those types of things is what you start weighing into the feasibility of those alternatives um, and and then it's discussed with the we'll be discussing it with the coalition and the team members and um, but but it's always going to be a consideration you got to look at it you got to look at the full full range of potential solutions. Dave, what about the data that the master plan is using uh, as far as current data versus current and global warming? How does that affect? Yeah. So um, the the hydrology, for example, um, right now all we have is the historical data. The hydrology that's been updated by CDOT and CWCB is based also on um, historical rainfall depths. Uh, NOAA. NOAA publishes those for the whole country. Um, they're doing what they call rainfall runoff models, so you know what, how many inches of rain over what duration is what frequency event that goes in there. Now, you know, you would you could argue that climate change is inherently in that data set because it's based on rainfall gauges throughout the years. Um, but looking forward down the 2050, 2100, 2500, that kind of climate change predictions. Um, is not something that is being addressed by this master plan. It's not typically. Um, that's, a, that's a different plan. It's a plan that people are just starting to really do nowadays. How is the master plan going to incorporate things like safety hazards, such as man-made structures like dams? Yep. How will that look at recreational? 
Yeah, so, so safety issues, um, don't see the gentleman, oh, there you are. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, I don't know if you're speaking of here in Lyons, but we've had that discussion in several of our meetings already. Some of those dams have, have some major safety issues that um, we're looking to try to address. Yeah, um, and uh, I did hear that in the meeting in Raymond last week. I don't know if, I don't know if you're the one who brought it up in that meeting as, as well, and I thought that was really interesting uh, and something we, we definitely want to talk to um, um, the Forest Service about and, and see what their philosophies are on that. So. But we heard you, and we're going to take that. We're going to see see where we can go with that. But, we do have a member of the Forest Service here tonight listening that's also part of the coalition. Yeah. So will it be in the plan? Uh, I don't know will yet. Be part of the plan? I don't know yet. I, Clean the debris out of the public lands? Or um, it's going to be open to discussion. I, 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 can't, I can't promise right now what's going to how it's going to evolve as we discuss it as a team and you know take that public input and, and share that among the coalition members and see what what feasibly we can do I mean that's that's one of the biggest challenges of floods everybody well, we assume everything all the FEMA studies assumes unobstructed flow that everything's just clean it's just ground it's not it's not realistic um, you know we all know that but that's kind of the industry standard, and um, that's where you set the bar. Because if not, you know how much how much debris do you anticipate? It's it's not it's not an exact science, um, and it causes other problems. So would people really, if you start if you start blocking up every every culvert, every bridge, forty percent, thirty percent, twenty percent, when that starts backing up on on the people upstream's property, and they're being told to pay flood insurance? And the rising premiums that, that are going on right now are they gonna are they gonna think it's 40 or 20 that type of thing are, are the challenges to those things um, but not to say that it's not it's not a good conversation to have and it's not something that in a master plan looking at the overall health of the watershed shouldn't be at least discussed as long as we're looking at the and some of the things going into the creek can you talk about mudslides and erosion and how that's going to be considered in the plan uh mudslides i'm gonna say no that's not that's not, not within the scope of, of a stream master plan. Now erosion, depending on what you're talking about, if you're talking mainly from uh, you know, erosion of uh, stream channel banks and that type of thing, yes, of course, we're looking at that geomorpho uh, geomorphology analysis I was talking about. Um, but if you're talking about erosion from you know, well above it, up on the hillside, um, no, that's, we're, we're focused on the stream in this one. That's a, that's a geotechnical study. <laughs> It's a little different animal. What about the habitat uh, analysis that's going to go into the master plan and wildlife passage? Yeah, for sure. That's that's all going to be taken into consideration. That's that when we say biological assessment and ecological and environmental, where we're talking about the fish and 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 um, and other animals and how they use the repairing corridor. Um, those will be taken into account. Okay, so we've got some follow-up. Pardon? Um, that's one of the ones we're coordinating with. They're not part of the coalition, but but they're being quite made aware of the study. Can I ask a rather interrelated question? What is the relationship with CDOT with this master plan? Because it seems to me that there's a lot of interrelation. You talk about habitat, and they're busy taking every stone out of the river, and every bank is nothing but rip around. Yeah. There was a fire sale on it. There's no habitat or slowing down a river channel, and there's no boulders or natural rock in the river. Yeah, for sure. That uh, seems to be happening kind of randomly on both county roads, the county road 80, as well as South St. Grain. I know there's some interaction on the North St. Grain with some restoration. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's happening, like, right now. Where's the interaction with that? Right. So, so CDOT is, does have a member on the coalition. Um, you know, I, I think when we did the interviews with CDOT, the first thing he says, we learned a lot about how we interact with the other agencies and the jurisdictions and what people like and what they don't like. They're, they, they've heard it. Um, you know, I, I guess when the governor said that those roads are going to be open in two months, uh, things kind of 
everything else kind of took a back, back seat. Well, so if we're talking about the streaming line, everyone wants to know where, where is it going to go? Where are we going to put it? Are we going to move it back to where it was? Are we going to let it go? Uh, and like I was saying before, that's what the, the first step in that is looking at the geomorphic analysis that I mentioned before. Where has the stream been traditionally? Where is it wanting to go? What kind of thing? What kind of... Um, what's a stable grade, all those types of things are going to inform that. Now, um, in areas where, say, it's in an open space, they might say, yep, let nature take its course. Status quo, leave it alone, let it do what it wants to do. But in areas like in Apple Valley, where there's, there's homes affected, maybe we, we don't have that option. It's going to be a case by case, but one of the main uh, main objectives of this plan is to have a, an alignment, a proposed alignment that then can be implemented so that people can actually know what, what the intent is of where to put it. Now, are things going to change next week? Yeah. Yeah, the water's going to keep flowing, and right now, in the state that it's all in, it's not in equilibrium, and it's going. Things are going to happen, and things are going to keep moving until something's done. Yeah, it's 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 long term. I mean, you're talking. It's dependent on funding, and then it's going to be dependent on who got the funding. So then, what the priority is? We will look at prioritizing the list of projects if they're interdependent. Say that, you know. Sizing that bridge depends on doing regional detention. Obviously, you got to do the regional detention before you do the bridge, you know, things like that. Um, but that's, that's, that's the intent of the plan, is to get something out there. Now, like you said, I mean, it could be five, ten years before something happens. Hopefully not. Hopefully we're, we're hitting this fast and hard, and um, that's going to bring the funding with it. It makes the decisions about where the, the stream goes some of those regulatory processes. Like I said, we're going to make recommendations on where the alignment should be based on the science that we that we do have, based on the modeling we have, based on the hydrology, once we once we come to a conclusion on that, based on the geomorphology, based on the, the ecological assessment, the, the connectivity of stream. We're going to make, make recommendations. Um, and then uh, the coalition is going to, and, and we're going to quantify it. We're going to, we're going to rank things. We're going to, we're going to tie numbers to it. Um, um, to justify why we're trying to make the decisions we're making. And then once everybody's in agreement on the coalition side, um, and we take that feedback, feedback from the public. If everybody's saying, we want it over here, and scientifically that's not a problem, then maybe it goes over there, even if, even if the stream wants to be over here. It's case by case. So what kind of timeline are we looking at? Well, that'll be that'll be in the in the final plan. Uh, like I said, that's going to depend on where the funding comes from, and and, and that. But there will be a, a plan to implement it. It'll be like, okay, well, maybe these are the hardest hit areas with the highest risk. We're looking at it as, you know, if it's going like right through downtown Lions, that's going to take precedent over something that's that doesn't have as much at risk, as much infrastructure, right? We got to rank it somehow. Um, when we're doing this on a case by case basis, though, how do we know how we can get involved as one of those case by cases? How do we, how do we that's, do that, right? that's where we're going to get. So we're doing here tonight. We want you to sign up for these community workshops to stay engaged in the conversation. So we identify what those are. That's why we're putting the website out there so people go and tell us what the issue is. We, have those on, but we need to hear these kinds of things. So we don't know. know we can be involved. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, then when we dive into those meetings after the, when we have a draft alignment, we can start getting that feedback. If you come to that meeting, and you can say like, no, I don't want it there, I want it here. And we'll say, well, we put it here for this reason, and but here's the challenges of putting it there, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's how we have the conversation. So do you have a follow-up question about channel alignment? Yes, I do. Okay, yeah. what is that? So you mentioned something about all the kind of space to what was your comment? If they want the river to go where they want it to go, they're going to let the river go. I'm saying, I'm saying there might be areas that letting nature take its course is the right thing to do. If it has the room to do it, it's not affecting any infrastructure. I'd use open space as a good example because, you know, if, if, if it's not going to hurt anybody upstream or downstream and they want to let nature take its course, that stream can meander around in there until it finds where it wants to be. And who's a cop, who, who kind of double checks that reference, who it affects down the line? Right, that's part of the master plan is looking at, okay, well, if that happens, 
is that going to have an effect online? That's part of what we weigh in on on the, on the alternatives. We're not going to propose something if we look at it and say, well, if they let that happen and it goes back into that gravel pond and goes off here and floods Longmont again, that's not good for any of us. We have to have that conversation. Yeah. That's part of the process. Sir, did you have a follow-up on channel alignment? Yes, we can do it. So it depends on what your definition of base floodplain is. Um, we are working right now, as I mentioned, we have all the all the models, some some newer information from CWCB. We're coming to a recommendation. All right, this is where we have good data. This is where we need better data. Um, but what are we going to use as the baseline for this for for, for this plan? Um, we're in the process of determining that. So, right. but that has to be done before we get the draft plan. So that's going to be determined in the next few months. And we do have some part of our scope to go out and do some supplemental hydraulics for areas that uh, might really, really be in need of it. Are irrigation diversions being considered? Yeah, um, as you saw on the coalition, St. Brain Left Hand uh, Water Conservancy District is part of the coalition. Sean Cronin has been um, very, very interactive with us on um, on the plan so far. They provided us a good GIS data set with all the diversion structures. Um, and they have really good reports on what's been done on them so far and what the what the plan is for the long term. And what about the information on mine and feasibility so far? Did that get addressed? Yeah, I think that that's really what we're looking at right now as far as the PG is just doing a feasibility study on that just to see if it even uh, if it if it makes yeah. sense from a flood mitigation standpoint and or uh, the property ownership on it and how that would work with the uh, reclamation requirements of the uh, mine and yeah, and like I said early on, we wanted to get in front of you guys as soon as possible to get you get you engaged in the in the process. Bear with us; we don't have a lot of answers right now. That's what we're working on. But and now you're going to know. Hey, when we when we have those dive in by the reaches, those next meetings, we're going to have some some more substantial data for you to dig into and really say, oh, you want to put it there? Oh, you want to do that there? That that's what's going to happen with Connell Ponds. I like that. I don't like that. What, what not? But but we're trying to express you. We've we've done a lot of work of trying to uh, digest all the efforts that have been done um, to the path uh, up until now in the last nine months. Um, so. Like I said, just just don't nothing set in stone. David, how are funding sources going to be identified, and how will the master plan be applied to this? The master plan will have a whole section on um, potential funding streams um, to implement the, the plan, and that's you know all kinds of grants. Um, you know, looking at everything from grants to whether people are interested in undertaking maybe a stormwater utility fee locally to help fund things. Just the full gamut, the, all the options. It's not going to set up how they're going to get funded. It's going to give direction, though, on what types of avenues are, po are possible. So, folks, I think you can see that the master plan addresses some, some big picture issues, but some of you still ask some very individual private property questions. And um, we could try to address some of them, but I think we probably want to turn it over to Boulder County and some of the other folks who can answer this stuff specifically about how to restore wells, um, timeline for repaving Riverside, plans for Boulder County Parks and Open Space Bio Program, and then I think there was a debris removal permit uh, question out there. Was that yours, ma'am? Yes, I'm just trying to find out if the federal government has given us any money or how much money that is okay. for debris removal. Um, before we go, I can, because I was at the meeting for the repaving of Riverside, um, it was very high on the priority list. Uh, as Julie mentioned, they have a, in those presentations, I think you can find on their website, it has all the different projects, how much they are, and, and what their timeline is. And I know they were trying to procure funding immediately, and I think it had like designed by August. It was one of the first ones out of the gate in the next phase of um, road improvements.